Good morning, everyone, from Heart Song Church here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. We pray that uh, as you watch this video, that uh, you are doing well today, that you are healthy, and that you are safe as well. As always, we appreciate you watching today. And uh, if the message does speak to you, I hope you'll, I don't know what it was, Miss Linda, like us, friend us, whatever it is, uh, do something to spread the word, not our word, but uh, God's word. Uh, as we try to seek uh, reach as many people as we can. I don't know about you, but I try to every day start off with a verse of the day, then I go into my time of reading. But the uh, verse that I came across today was from the familiar Old Testament book of Habakkuk. Now I'm sure we've all read from Habakkuk a lot here lately. When you say Habakkuk, it sounds like you need to say God bless you after it. But anyway, from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, listen what the Old Testament prophet had to say. And of course, he's referring to Almighty God here. He said, His splendor and majesty covers the heavens, and the earth is full of His praise. His brightness is like the sunlight, and He has bright rays flashing from His hands, and there in the sun is the hiding place of His glory. Man, I don't know about you, but I just love that. Amen. God, that's just awesome. As I think about how awesome uh, that our God is. When I read those verses, I used to uh, listen to a group a lot, Christian group, uh, Third Day. I don't know if any of you have heard of them. They're not together anymore. Uh, Mac Powell, the leader, has gone out on his own, I think. But anyway, they had a song called God of Wonders. And again, I'll be gracious to you today. I'm just going to read a couple lines from it. I won't sing it to you. Hey, but I would encourage you, go on YouTube and type it in. God of Wonders, Third Day. It's an awesome awesome song some of the lyrics go like this lord of all creation of water earth and sky the heavens are your tabernacle glory to the lord on high god of wonders beyond our galaxy you are holy you are holy the universe declares your majesty for you are holy you are holy Anyway, I hope you will uh, check that out because it is a great song. Well, believe it or not, this is the first Sunday in what month? June. June. Good gracious. It'll be uh, Father's Day this month and the first day of summer later this month. Hard to believe we're in a new month. So uh, those of heart song know that a new month means a new what? Memory verse. Those of you that are watching that aren't a part of heart song, we try to memorize a verse a month together. And the verse that I've chosen for this month is Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. Where there Paul talking to the church at Ephesus. First of all, in the verses before, he reminded them of really what scoundrels they used to be. And he kind of wraps it up with verse 8 by saying, You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, live like the children of light. So uh, that's the verse that we're going to memorize this month together. If you're not a part of Heart Song, hey, I'd welcome you to memorize the verse anyway. Uh, but it's a great verse that reminds us, hey, we're not what we used to be. Amen? Thanks to the glory and grace of God, we're not what we used to be. Well, uh, speaking of Bible verses and the Word of God, grab your copy of God's Word. And I'll tell you just a second where to turn to. Uh, but as you pick your Bible up there or you turn it on on your phone or your tablet, whatever you're going to do there, I was reminded this morning of a phrase, and I'm pretty sure that they, uh, you'll find this in the front of every Gideon Bible that's you know, placed out in different places. But it says this, the Bible, read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. I think that's some great, uh, great advice to all of us. Amen. So I hope that we will take advantage of that. The Bible, read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. Well, back at the start of the year 2020, which seems like 20 years ago, we embarked on a sermon series here at Heart Song that we entitled A Journey Through James. Any of y'all here today remember it? You remember that far back? Uh, well, now, we were doing a journey through James. So what book of the Bible were we looking at? James. Uh, I'm glad you said James 
Because if you hadn't, Miss Cheryl, we were just going to turn the video off and go home right now. So but anyway, so turn there to the book of James, the New Testament book. You'll find it right after the book of Hebrews. And uh, I want to get back on that journey today. And we're going to do that as we look at chapter 4. And we're going to think about war. What's it good for? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And you know, as I came up with that title, I remember the old 1970 hit single by Edwin Starr. War, what's it good for? Absolutely nothing. Ken, I don't know why I keep doing that to myself. But anyway, that's what we're going to look at today. So from James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, you follow along in your copy of God's Word there uh, as I'm reading from the New International Version today. It goes like this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And then when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives more grace, and this is why the Scripture says God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So therefore, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and justify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. So humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Almighty God, I pray now as we look at your blessed word, Lord, would you take this time to speak to our hearts and not only speak to our hearts and fill our heads, but Lord, change our lives. Help us to take to heart what James has written here and use it each and every day, not just on Sunday in church, but every day of our life and our walk with you. In the precious name of Jesus, I ask you, amen. Well, let's do just a little refresher on James because those of us that were journeying with us, so it's been a bit, so let's get our mind back around who we're talking about. Now, first of all, who was James? Anybody here today remember who James was? Or anybody out there in video land? Brother of Jesus. There you go. Ms. Eleanor said he was the brother of Jesus, which is exactly right. He was pastor at what I uh, called First Church, Jerusalem. He was pastor there at the First Christian Church in Jerusalem. Well, who did James write to? Well, he wrote to Christians scattered all throughout the Roman Empire, starting with the believers in the church at Jerusalem. Well, in his commentary on James, Reverend John MacArthur said this, quote, What we do reveals who we are. What we do reveals who we are, end quote. And that phrase kind of summarizes the whole book of James. Hey, friends, if you don't know it already, James was a no-nonsense kind of preacher. You can tell by the verses we read right here. He didn't read how to win friends and influence enemies. He didn't really care about that. He wanted people to do right, and so that's what he wrote, and that's what he preached. And over and over, we've already seen in the book of James, and we'll see it as we finish the book, James would tell his audience, you say that you're a Christian, you say that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then act like it. Show me, don't just tell me. And here in chapter 4, friends, it sounds like some of the members in the church at Jerusalem or the church at large there in his area, they weren't acting very Christ-like, so we're going to check it out today. You know, since the beginning of recorded time, uh, people have gotten angry, they've had disagreements, they fought, and some have even killed each other. Hey, good grief, y'all. It only took three chapters in the book of Genesis before we had the first murder. Do you remember who killed who? Cain killed his brother, Abel. 
I think the crowd here has got a little camera shyness as well as me, maybe. But anyway, Cain killed Abel. And so we know since then that mankind has been at unrest. Now, there's no way to know exactly how many wars have been fought. But since the end of World War II, there have been recorded some 250 major wars. And in those wars, you know, over hundreds of millions of people have been killed. Uh, tens of millions have been, called, have been made homeless. And, uh, millions more have been injured and bereaved. And friends, in those wars and in wars throughout history, some of them have been fought over the most trivial matters. I get this, and I hope you're sitting down because you're not going to believe some of these I found. About a thousand years ago, war broke out between two French cities over a dispute about the ownership of a water bucket. And then, too, one Chinese emperor, I read, he went to war because someone broke his little teapot. I could not have, I'm a little teapot, short and stout. You know, anyway. One of the many battles fought between England and France broke out when one, uh, one guest spilled a glass of wine on another. Hey, well, I'd say those were ridiculous. Wouldn't you agree? But sadly, the same has been true in countless churches over the years as friends have become enemies and they have fought over the most trivial matters. I've seen people have arguments over the color of the carpet we're going to put down. I've seen people break out and get mad over the kind of light fixtures we were going to put up. And good grief, just a few years back, how many arguments broke out in church business meetings over the kind of music that we were going to sing and play in the church. And friends, I'm not lying to you. Once when we were uh, pastoring, uh, we were living in uh, Cleveland, Georgia, going to school there, we found out of a church that split at a church picnic when two members fought over who got the last piece of fried chicken. It literally broke out into a fist fight and two groups started going at each other. Now, much as I like chicken, Miss Linda, that may be worth fighting over, but anyway, not to split a church. So in spite of treaties that have been made, despite the efforts of world peace organizations, despite the threat of atomic bombs, war remains a fact of life. And it's always sad to hear of any war that breaks out among nations. But let me tell you, friends, it's especially sad when it's a war between God's people. So we're going to look today and learn from James as he candidly talks about three wars that were going on within the early church then, and sadly to say, maybe going on within churches today. First of all, in verse 1, James says that we are at war with each other. Friends, we are at war with each other. He says there, right at the beginning, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Everybody here say among. Among. If you're sitting out there in video land, say among. Among you. Let's think about this. The word fights, it means a prolonged combat. And then when he said the word quarrels, it literally means an all-out battle. So what James is addressing here, friends, it's not a one-time occurrence, but rather it's some ongoing skirmish among the members of that early church. Now, how ironic when I think of what Jesus said in John chapter 13, 34, and 35. When there in verse 34, he looked at his disciples and he said, As I have loved you, so now you are to love one another. And the word for love Jesus used there in the Greek is agapo, and it means a total, selfless, sacrificing love. And we know Jesus loved like that, amen? Because he gave everything he had, including his very life, for you and me. And so then in verse 35, after telling the disciples, as much as I have given you, I want you to love other people, he says, a new command I give you that you love one another. And he used that same word, except a little different phrase, agape, that among his children, we are to agape each other. We are to love one another with a total, selfless, all-out, sacrificing love. And then Jesus went on to say that by showing this love, all people will know 
that you're my disciples. Uh, Tertullian, he was one of the early church uh, writers and theologians. In one of his early works, he was writing about the early church, the early followers of Christ. And he noted in there what the pagans, those outside of the body of Christ, what they were saying about Christ's followers. And the pagans were saying this, see how they love each other. So friends, that's one of the things that characterized the early followers of Christ. It was the love that they had for each other, and it was so great, so intense, that it shone to the entire unsaved world. Well, I don't know what happened during the years there between the early church and what James is saying here, but instead of displaying love and brotherhood among each other, the early members here at the Church of Jerusalem, they were uh, full of factions and fighting. There was struggling. There was strife. But the sad thing is, it wasn't aimed at fighting the devil or stopping sin. No, instead, James says that they were at war with each other. Now, years ago, before the days of radio and radar, which uh, I don't think any of us can remember that, you know, even some of us got a few uh, gray hairs. We remember radio and radars. But anyway, two battleships met in the night and they engaged in battle with one another. In the conflict, many of the crewmen were injured. Some of them were killed and both of the vessels were severely damaged. And friends, as daylight broke, the sailors on both of those vessels were horrified when they discovered that both of them were flying the same flag. All during the night, they were fighting one another. Let me tell you how sad it is to hear of when just one of our soldiers are killed in battle. Amen? Amen. We don't want to hear of one kill. But what is even sadder to hear is that when one of our soldiers is killed by what they call friendly fire, when it's one of their own countrymen that inadvertently kills them. And thinking of that, don't you know that the devil, he sits back and he roars with laughter when he sees a church full of friendly fire. When instead of battling Satan and sin, members begin to fight each other and kill each other off, doing the devil's dirty work for him. Uh, Warren Wearsby, he's a guy that gone home to be with the Lord now, but I, I have his commentary set. Uh, in his study on James, he said this, thinking about fighting one another. He said, quote, why are we at war with, ourselves, with each other? He said, we belong to the same family. We trust the same Savior. We're indwelt by the same Holy Spirit, but yet we fight. And why is that? End quote. Well, I say to Reverend Wearsby and anybody else wondering why do we fight each other? Thankfully, James goes on and he tells us we fight with each other because of number two, because of the war going on within ourselves. And he says that again in verse one there. He said, isn't it because you are full of selfish desires that fight to control your body? So James says, we fight each other because we got a war going on inside of us. You know, when he said desire there, he used the Greek word hedonon, which we get the English word hedonism. It basically means to satisfy at all cost. It's uh, truly selfishness, full blown at its worst. A while back, uh, I was telling Kim, my wife, I said, uh, I need to get my eyes checked. Things that used to be clear to me are now getting a little fuzzy. Well, you know, that's one kind of eye trouble. That's E-Y-E. -E. But friends, there is a much worse type of eye problem, and it's just the capital I. I want you to think about this. I learned this years ago at the Christian school. I did listen every now and then, Brother Larry. The teacher said, someone spell the word sin for me. Somebody spell sin. How do you spell it? S what? I N. Hey, somebody spell the word pride. Getting a little harder. That was three letters. Now we got five. Somebody spell pride for me. That's right, Brother Terry. P R I D E. What's in the middle of sin? I. What's in the middle of pride? I. You get the hint? You get the hint? Sin, friends, it is the root of sin is selfishness. 
Well, we always think that our ideas are the only right ideas. We think that our ways are the only right ways. And by the way, let me share this with you. People that are at war within themselves because of selfishness, they're always unhappy people. They never enjoy life for instead of being thankful for the and counting the blessings they do have, they're always thinking about what they don't have. They can't get along with other people because they're envious, they're covetous of what other people have or what other people have accomplished. And they're always looking for that magical something that's gonna change their life when the real problem is not without, but rather it is what? It's within. And James goes on to tell these people in, the, in, in verse two there, he said, look, you're fighting for something you don't have. And he said, you don't have it because number one, you haven't asked God for it. And then he said, number two, you don't have it even because even when you do ask, you ask for the wrong thing. He said, you're asking for worldly appetites. And he said, you're asking from the wrong reason to fulfill your selfish desires. He's not painting a pretty prick picture of the church people, amen? I'm telling you. So he says we're at war among each other, and he tells us why. It's because we're at war within ourselves. But then, friends, he goes on and he tells us number three now about another war being waged, and that is being at war with God. Look there at verse four. He said, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Hey, now, when you think of an enemy of God, who comes to mind? And don't say anybody's name, okay? Not your family, your friends, your neighbor's name, because it's on video. But what kind of person do you think of when you think of an enemy of God? Oh, man, Hitler. Yeah, think of Hitler. Somebody like a Hitler. An atheist. An atheist, an agnostic. Maybe think of a child molester, a wife beater, somebody like that. But friends, remember, who is James talking to here? He's talking to the good church members at the Church of Jerusalem and to Christians all around the empire there. And he is warning them of becoming an enemy of God. And then again, in his classical in-your-face kind of approach, what did he call them in verse 4? He said, you adulterous people. You adulterous people. Now, you know, when I was in seminary, they didn't tell us to start out at our first church by calling all the good members, you bunch of adulterous people. You know, think about what is an adulterer? Well, it is basic meaning it's someone who is unfaithful to their mate. And using James' thought process and what he's getting at here is there's probably some adulterers listening to me today. Oh, maybe not in the sense that uh, you're thinking, because James intentionally used this term for he knew his Jewish audience would know exactly what he was talking about. You see, throughout the Old Testament, God often referred to Israel as his bride. And then, in fact, in the New Testament, the church is often referred to as what? The bride of Christ. <laughs> hey, Brother Ken, when I first studied that, I thought the bride of Frankenstein. Sometimes that's what we're like. But anyway, he refers to it as the, we're the bride of Christ. So it doesn't matter. And so whether it's Israel in the Old Testament, whether it's the church of the New Testament, or whether it is us as believers today, when we are having an affair with this world, or when we play around with, when we flirt with sin, then we are being guilty of being unfaithful to Almighty God. And so therefore, we are an adulterer in the worst way possible when we are unfaithful to Holy God. And you know, when you think about it, when a spouse is unfaithful, what happens to the offended party? What happens to the innocent one? Man, of course, they're heartbreaking, amen? They're devastated. So Christian brother and sister, remember that the next time we play around with sin, that when we sin, that we are hurting Almighty God. We are grieving the Holy Spirit that lives within us. You know, it reminds me of a story I read years ago. It was near the end of school, and uh, you know, kids were gonna get together. They were gonna have an end of the year school party. 
Uh, there was going to be a lot of drinking there, probably a lot of drugs, a lot of other illicit stuff was going to be going on. So uh, some of the kids at church on that Wednesday night before the Friday of the party, they were talking about, are you going to go? Are you going to go? I'm going. You know, are you going? I'm going. One of the girls spoke up and she says, I'm not going to this party. And one of the boys sitting there kind of snidely remarked to her, oh, I know why you're not going to go. You're not going to go because you're afraid of what your dad will do to you. You're afraid your dad will hurt you if he finds out what you do there. And she says, no, you don't understand at all. That's not why I'm not going. I'm not afraid of my dad hurting me. She said, I'm not going because if I go and he finds out, it'll hurt him. Hey, friends, that's a big difference. We don't serve, we don't serve God because we're afraid he's going to hurt us, but rather we serve him because we want to make sure that we don't hurt him. Well, you know, here on this terrestrial ball that we call earth, that we call home, the Bible tells us we're living in enemy territory. Amen? Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's got a little control right now. And so Paul tells us we're constantly, we're bombarded by his schemes, by the wiles of the devil, he calls it. Even his demons, they oppose us every day. So we need a battle plan to stay on the right path and thankfully, James gives us that as we start to land the plane here. For in verses 6 and 7, he said, you want to get rid of the war among yourselves? You want to get rid of the war within yourself? You want to end this battle with God? In verse 6 and he seven, 7, he says, then you need to stay humble before God and submit yourself to Him. Now, you think about this one. Well, this is one of the things I love about studying. I love to find out something new, Miss Cheryl. And I found out that this word submit, it's a military term, and it means to get in rank, to get in rank. And it carried the idea of obeying the one in command and not resisting his or her orders. Hey, I've mentioned many times, uh, my all-time favorite TV show is the Andy Griffith Show. You know, where the characters in the fictitious Mayberry, you know, they just live in bliss and quite often in ignorance as well. But anyway, in one episode, old Barney, he buys a dog to help, as he said, track down vicious criminals since they have so many in Mayberry. So Barney gets this dog. He looks like a huge, ugly, uh, dirty Airedale or Terry or something. I don't know. But anyway, Barney's trying to train this dog. And Barney would say, sit, Blue. And what would Blue do? He'd stand up. And then Barney would say, get up, Blue. And the dog would what? Lie flat out on the floor. The whole show was all about the dog would not submit to Barney's commands, and it created a rift in their relationship. Well, think about that with our Heavenly Father. This word submit in the Greek, it indicates it is a voluntary action. So James is telling us that we are to gladly, we are to willingly, joyfully even accept God's rule over us. We are to obey his commands, friend, obey his command, friends, because we want to, not because we have to. You know, we need to give ourselves over to him willingly instead of not go down kicking and screaming. Hey, it's like the uh, little boy I heard he kept running around in the house. His dad told him over and over to stop, but the boy just kept running and running. So they went back and forth. He was running, sit down. He was running, sit down. Finally, the dad grabbed the little boy by the shoulders, sat him on the sofa, and he said, now sit. To which the little boy looked up at his dad and he said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm standing up. You know, we shouldn't do that with our heavenly father. Friends, unconditional surrender to Him is the only way to victory. You know, if there is any part, any part of our life that we are keeping back from God's rule, then there is always going to be a battle. Hey, one of the heroes of the Bible, King David, who hasn't heard, you know, who has, we've all read of King David. And we all know when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, which then led to David having her husband killed in battle. Well, friends, David hid that sin for a year. Or should I say he tried to hide that sin for a year. And all that year, there was constant war between him and God. 
If you don't believe me, just read Psalm 32 and 51 and you will see the high price David paid to be at war with God. And it was only when he finally submitted to God could David once again enjoy peace and joy like he had before. But it was all because he was willing to submit. And let me tell you, friends, submit don't come naturally. I don't know about you, but to me. Submission, it is an act of our will. It is a conscious decision. We don't get it by osmosis. You know, it doesn't just come to us. We choose to do it. It's just like when Jesus said, Not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. But let me tell you, beloved one, when we are close to God, then we can resist the devil. And James says, and then he will have to flee from us. You know, now this verse 7, Miss Pamela, I've heard this. This is one of those verses in the Bible that's so misquoted. So many times, whatever the situation going on was, somebody would just say, well, just resist the devil and he has to flee from you. And I always want to speak up and say, no, you didn't get it just right. You left out the first and most important part because you must first of all submit to God and then you resist the devil and then the old snake has to slither away from you. You know, think about it. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Spoken that way, friends, that verse is not true at all. I don't, Satan is not the least bit afraid of you and I. He is more clever than we are, stronger than we are. Before his fall, I believe he was the highest, wisest, most beautiful of all created beings. Now he is the ruler of countless legions of demons. He is the master of deception. He's had 6,000 plus years of practice in manipulating people. So don't think for one second that in our own power that the devil is afraid of us. He's not. And he's not going to back down. He's not going to run and he's not going to hide from us until we what? Submit to God. And as we submit to God, as we draw close to him, then we will experience God's presence in our life. We will feel his power in our weakness and we will experience his provision in our time of need. But notice, we have to take the first step. Because as James says, when you come near to God, then he will come near to thee. You know, to me, it's all about why is it that way? Why does God wait for us to take the first step? Because then and only then does it show that we are serious in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. You know, in Luke chapter 15, the father of the prodigal son he didn't go run into the far country looking for his boy, did he? No, he didn't. What did he do? He waited and he watched. And friend, let me tell you, when that prodigal came to his senses and when he headed back home to the father, what did the father do when he saw him at a great distance? It says the father ran to meet the son. You know, the story of the prodigal, it is all about someone genuinely sorry for the wrongs that they have done. It is about someone willing to humble themselves, willing to admit their failure, willing to accept help. And when we do that, just like the prodigal, God welcomes us with open arms. I don't know about you, but that's an incredible promise. Amen? Amen. That the Almighty God that we talked about at the beginning of the video, He wants to come to us. He wants to be close to us. He wants to protect us from the wiles of the devil and the attacks of the evil one. So he will graciously draw near to us when we deal with the sin in our life that causes us to be at war within ourselves. When we put away the foolishness that causes us to fight amongst one another. And when we reject the friendship of this world that causes us to be an enemy of God. Hey, I'll close with this illustration right here i was thinking about this the other day ron you're a our video guru here uh we were talking at work the other day about videoing and how 
videoing has just, man, come light years of what it used to be. Y'all remember when the home video cameras first came out? You know, it looked like a TV studio camera you had to have up on your show. We bought one from Sears. Who, who would ever thought Sears isn't even here anymore? But we bought one from Sears. We were so excited. We took that thing home. I read the directions, you know, figured out how to use it. And we went for a drive in the mountains of North Georgia to try it out. Well, as I pointed the camera at the rolling mountains, and it was in the fall of the year, the leaves, it looked like the trees were on fire. We were so excited. We were going to video this and, you know, go home and watch it and keep it forever, not knowing that we wouldn't even have a VHS player anymore. But anyway, as I pointed the camera at the beautiful mountains and the leaves, I began to notice the lens just going zip out and in, out and in, out and in. I told Kim, this stupid camera is broken. We're gonna have to take it back. And then I realized the problem. My window was rolled up and the lens didn't know whether to focus on the scenery outside or the image reflecting off of the glass. And only when the focus was right was the picture clear. And to me, friends, that's the thrust of what James is telling today. We need to have the right focus. And when we focus, first of all, on Almighty God and submit to Him, then selfishness, envy, covetousness, it'll fall away. And it will have no place in our personal life and in the lives of our churches. May Almighty God take this word today, friends, and may He apply it to our heart uh, as Heart Song Church. And I know I have friends that go to other churches. May God apply it to, uh, to your uh, circumstance or situation as well. Almighty God, we thank you again so much for your holy word because from it we learn how to live. You have given us the very words of eternal life and from them we know how to be saved by confessing our sin and accepting the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And then as your children, we know how we are to live as believers together. You have told us here in your word today. So dear God, help us to take to heart what you would have for us to learn and what you would have for us to do. And I ask you this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Stay healthy. Stay well. And who knows, it won't be long, we'll be able to be back together. God bless.